Yeah, so we had gotten into the bug is crawling on me. And I pointed out that the bug can't crawl on you, whatever you are, you are not buggy. That the, bu that the bug can crawl on the leg, but you are not the leg. Bug can crawl on the arm, but you're not the arm. When you become the bug is crawling on me, that's where the source of fear is. Oh, I'm in danger. And rather than it's just the body. And the body can handle a bug. May swell up, but that's okay. So this idea of, uh, of identifying with things, Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa says uh, nothing is worth uh, identifying with as I, me, and mine. And yet people identify with a, uh, with a party, they identify with a religion, they identify with a particular cosmetic, they identify with their clothes. And in fact, a whole lot of people get really, really lied to and duped because they have that uh, delusion, I am the body. For instance, why do girls and women wear makeup? Because they have the statement, I am not beautiful. Somewhere in the back of their mind. And so they paint the face so that nobody can see the real face. And everybody says, oh, isn't she gorgeous? When in fact, what they're saying is, ain't that paint job gorgeous? <laughs> <laughs> Yay for Max Factor. <laughs> And so people identify with the body, they identify with the thoughts. They have a uh, uh, language like I'm thinking or in my humble opinion, et cetera, like that. And then in fact, very, very few thoughts are original. Almost all the thoughts that ordinary people have, they got it from someplace else. For instance, I hate a politician, I hate Biden, or I hate Trump, is actually in information a sentence that they learned off of the media. Depends upon which media they're watching. If they're watching Fox, they hate Biden. If they're watching MSNBC, they hate Trump. <laughs> Better not to watch any of that stuff and stop hating. Yeah, they're... People are being told who to like. Mm -hmm. And we, we pick that up without understanding that it's all just a pack of lies. And you've been picking stuff up, a whole pack of lies, your whole life. And so when your teacher and your mommy see I am the body and wear makeup, then you as a little boy, you pick that up and you say, oh, well, I'm a body too. And yet you've been watching that body change and you couldn't do much of anything about it. Now, could you? Other than buy clothes to fit it. Yeah. And that's just uh, put decorations on it or something. Put decorations on it. Wear beads or mala around the neck. In, in fact, the word necklace sounds really crazy. Why should somebody have a necklace when you need a neck? <laughs> Why should somebody be netless? Hmm. So identification is something to start watching for. Start looking at words like I, me, or my. The bugs can't crawl on you. And so you say, uh, I'm afraid because the bug is crawling on me. Bugs can't crawl on you. Bugs can't find you. You can't even find you. You've already asked me, who am I? Actually, there's a sutta, number two, the Saba Asava Sutta, 
where the Buddha specifically points out that who am I, what was I in the past, what will I be in the future, how can I move from now to my future self, and all of those kinds of questions he calls a thicket of views. Unwise attention. And redefine unwise attention is, is that it doesn't help us. Makes us feel worse. But when we start paying wise attention, then several things happen. And what is wise attention? Wise attention is to the Four Noble Truths. Say the bug is on me is a thought of dukkha. Instead of just saying that there's a bug. And so you don't like the bug. You're afraid of the bug. That's the second noble truth. The creation of the dukkha is because you don't like it. Why? Because you're afraid of it. Why? Because you identify with the body. And so we begin to pay attention to the Four Noble Truths. Rather than paying attention to me, we start paying attention to reality. Because if you can do that, then you can stop it. You can start paying wise attention. You can remember to see that I am the body that's, that has a bug on it. The bug is on me. We can see that that's an unwholesome thought and make a change. Aha, I'm glad that bug's not on me. Aha, I see my thought of the bug is on me, but the bug cannot possibly be on me. I don't even know who I am. How could the bug possibly find me? The bug can find a body, but you're not the body. You're not your thoughts. You're not even your attitude. But the attitude that most people have is the attitude of a victim. For instance, the bug is on me. That means that you're a victim to the bug. Could you not have a thought of, wow, what a beautiful little bug. Wow, isn't that an interesting bug? No, you say, I'm afraid because the bug is on me. So look at all that unwholesome thought process and underlying it is the attitude of being a victim to the bug. And by correct practice, we can come out of that victimhood and start having the attitude of being a winner. Hey, I can handle a bug. Hey, I can handle the mosquito bite. Nothing to it. It's not me the bug, uh, the mosquito has bitten. It's the body. The body will heal. And here it is. I don't like the mosquito bite. Can you see that? Oh, I don't like it. Well, if you don't like it, why don't you put some salve on it and take care of it? No, people will ignorantly scratch the mosquito bite. They may slap it, which forces half the mosquito into their skin. They've killed the bug, they've killed the mosquito, but they've left half of it in their skin. To continue to itch and irritate and put their own kind of saliva in it, as well as all the bacteria in their saliva. Better thing to do is to say, bye bye. And then the bug itself will decide, hey, this is too much wind here. And so he withdraws his own uh, beak from your skin and flies away. But if you hate that mosquito because the mosquito is biting you, you may make it worse. So the whole practice of the Eightfold Noble Path 
the whole practice of Anapanasati is to start seeing these kind of unwholesome thoughts, the bug is on me, or I am a Republican, or I am a Democrat, and stop identifying with all kinds of things. That in fact, women often identify as a woman, but the one, but the what they're identifying with is cultural norms. Women are supposed to be like this and supposed to be like that. And when you, when people like Christians have a strong identification about what is a man and what is a woman, they have a whole lot of rules built into it. They wind up making themselves miserable. And then they pass their misery on to other people. Let's pass a law. Let's make it a law. What I don't like, nobody should like. <laughs> And what they don't like is just a matter of a bunch of rules that some preacher on a pulpit pounded on the Bible and said, this is the rule. And people believe what they've been told. Stop believing what you've been told and instead investigate it as to whether it's real or not. And if it's real, then it's knowledge. And if you don't know because you haven't investigated, then that's the belief. And victims believe a lot of stuff. Wise people don't believe anything. The statement would be, I don't believe in belief. Yes, uh, believe in investigation. Believe in knowledge. But then we change the word belief. So a better way even to say it is, is that I don't believe in belief because I know that knowledge and experience and investigation is better than belief. So I don't believe in anything. I know. Or I don't know. If I don't know, then I don't know, and I know that I don't know, and I'm happy that I don't know. Because if I'm unhappy that I don't know, that's because I'm in doubt. And then I have to go find out in order to get rid of the doubt and get rid of the bad feelings. But if I'm comfortable and happy, not sure, then I don't have to do so much investigation. I'm just already happy. And this is what we practice. To remember to look at those unwholesome thoughts. I am this, I am that. Look at the doubt. That in fact, many times I've had students who come on and I start to teach them. They ask one question after another, a question after another question, because they think that they have to understand it and get it right before they start practicing. And that's not correct. They'll never get started because they'll never be sure. They'll never figure it out. So how do we actually then practice is we start practicing. We start remembering to look at our unwholesome thoughts and then change them. What could be simpler? It's a simple practice. It just needs to be practiced over and over and over and over and over again. To see those thoughts and to change them. That's all there is to it. So I imagine now that when you start to say a bug is on me, you'll remember. Today, the uh, the bug was crawling around and I just ignored the bug. I figured the bug is looking for a drink or some some sweat or something. Mm -hmm. But instead of ignoring the bug, you could have made friends with it.
Hello, Mr. Pug. I see you. But then after you said that you uh, ignored the bug, then you had the thought the bug is on me, which is an unwholesome thought. It's yeah. unwholesome for several reasons. One of them is that it's not possible. <laughs> and another one is, is that you don't like it when the bug is on me. But if you say, oh, there's that bug, then that's a wholesome thought. If you say, oh, hello, Mr. Bug, I see you, then that's wholesome. That is, um, that is how I think nearly everyone perceives the world at one time uh, early in life. Mm -hmm. And we pick that up from our parents. We pick that up from our siblings, Aunt Susie's, grandmas. And then by the time that we're in the first grade, we get a really strong dose of it from the teachers. And we pick that stuff up because we're too young and too unwise, not developed enough to recognize that they're full of crap. <laughs> Mommy's unhappy, therefore I should be unhappy. Yeah, I did uh, pick up a lot of um, dislikes from my parents. And uh, not as much from the teachers. <clears throat> the teachers only reinforce what you got from your parents. Yeah. More evidence. <laughs> yeah, that's... Uh, people have a lot of different um, decorations that they put on themselves. Uh, that people have uh, a, a lot of different... Uh, people identify on themselves or on their bodies of uh, both uh, they they identify a lot with a lot of different things mm -hmm. uh, a bunch of letters ms yeah. phd smws phd education bs uh, a woman once told me that she is a paper towel girl. A paper towel girl. <laughs> Which means she comes unraveled easily, I suppose. Yeah, she did have that. Um, yeah. Very easily. <laughs> So the better thing to do is to not identify with anything. But in fact, when you do identify with something, remember to see that, remember to look and to see it, because then you have a choice. Aha, I see me identifying. I see that identification. Wow, what a relief it is to not identify with towels, <laughs> especially paper, Max Factor. Gucci, Rolex. <laughs> BMW, Mercedes, people identify with all kinds of things.
the reason that people identify with things mostly is because they are, are victims, that they're not as good without that stuff. Is it is it an attempt when when people identify with different things? Is it an attempt to be loved? Well, it's an attempt to be okay. It's an attempt to be lovable. And why should we lo need love? It's because we have the feeling of I'm not okay. If you have the feeling of you're okay, then you don't need to be loved. You don't need somebody's love in order to feel okay. When the boy says to the girl, oh, do you love me? What he's really saying is, I'm a piece of crap. Please talk me out of it. <laughs> but if he's already OK, he doesn't need her love. And if he doesn't need her love, and they're in a relationship, say they're married, the marriage will probably last if he doesn't need her, but if he needs her love, she's going to take a hike. Right down to the lawyer's office. <laughs> oh. He's too needy. When in fact, he's just feeling not okay. So whenever you think that you need somebody's love, you can say, aha, I see that. I see that I have victimized myself into feeling not lovable and you want somebody to love you. And then you can say, wow, I'm glad I saw that because I'm already OK. The reality is, is that I'm already OK. Wanting to be loved is a lie. Yeah, that's it's um uh, it seems that if somebody is needing to be loved, then they're they're insecure about that if they're asking someone if they love them. Yeah, you can tell somebody you love them because that'll make them feel better. Because they don't feel okay. Mm. But probably a more truthful thing to say is, hey, you're OK. You're doing a great job of being alive. Hmm. So when you feel OK on your own, then you can come around to seeing other people. They're all OK. You're, no problem. In fact, earlier in the conversation, we weren't talking about you at all, we were talking about a brown camera. <laughs> but if you identify this is my camera, then you'll probably feel bad. Where in fact, that's not you, that camera. It's completely replaceable. You're not that camera at all. So this is the right way to practice. This is the Eightfold Noble Path, is to start looking at all of these thoughts that we have that wind us up in uh, bad feelings. Here's an example of a bad feeling, is the guy wants a girl, and so he goes and he buys a car. Thought, in fact, what they call a chick magnet. And then he's got to make payments on it. It gets scratched and dented. The uh, the leather seats get torn. And the car didn't get him a girl at all. So now he's got a car he don't want and he don't need. And he still doesn't have the girl that he wanted. And he could have seen that, oh, I want a girl, but I'm okay without one. But in fact, the Buddha talks about it in the, in the sense of dukkha, 
is easily defined as wanting something you don't have. If you want something you don't have, like you wanted that uh, bug to be gone. <laughs> it's if it's you, so... <laughs> It's it's a much easier challenge than than going out to get a car to uh, accept the bug. <laughs> exactly, but you can see how people, in fact, when they want something they don't have, then underlying that is the attitude or belief is is that I need it. I'll be better off if I had it which means now that they've already developed that victim's mentality of I'm not good enough because I don't have what I want. And if you can see that thought, oh, I want to get rid of that bug or um, I want a girl or I want a coffee or I want uh, Johnny Walker Black. Here in Thailand, there is no Johnny Walker Black. So the story is, there's no Johnny. I want Johnny Walker Black, and there's none in the house. Now I've got to go down to um, uh, the town, and there's no liquor stores in the town except at uh, um, uh, Tesco. And Tesco doesn't have Johnny Walker Black. So what am I going to do now? I got to fly to Bangkok. <laughs> go all over Bangkok looking for Johnny Walker Black, and it's not even imported in Thailand. Oh, poor me! I want Johnny Walker Black. <laughs> And all that time, he thought he'd be better off with Johnny Walker Black when, in fact, he'd have been better off if he just says, I don't need Johnny Walker Black. I can drink coffee or water instead. So when we want things we don't have, we're not good enough. We're a victim to the reality that we don't have what we want. We're incomplete. We're not whole. But when you stop wanting things that you don't have, then you're already complete. You're already whole. You're already good enough. You're already okay. You're just fine. And then we can feel satisfied. Well, I'm all right. Don't need Johnny Walker Black or that car. Don't need anything. I'm okay. Got it made. Whatever it was. Basically, is just that I don't have it made so much as is that I don't need to make anything. Already got all that I need. And that leads us into feeling safe, secure, comfortable, and satisfied. That's the practice. Can you practice being satisfied to where you are? Yes. So when everything in any thoughts of I need this and I need that come up, the question first off is, is it easy enough to get? If it's not easy to get, then never mind, I don't need it. I gave a talk one time called the best things in life are free. And the only thing that you really need is this next breath and it's free. The best things in life are things like friendship. The friendship is free. I know that a whole lot of people buy friendship because they don't know it's free. One of the best things in life is freedom from politics. Free from politicians. Don't have to worry about them at all. Let them go fight it out. That's their business, not my business. I'll be okay no matter what happens. That's the winner's attitude. But if you say, oh, no, if that guy wins, 
we'll have a disaster. And look, you've got millions of people on both sides saying that. And everybody's really uptight because that other guy may win and then we'll have a disaster. <clears throat> yeah, it's kind of funny how people, uh, they think uh, they try and predict what politicians are going to do and they have no way of predicting what they're going to do. Yeah, nobody knows what the future is going to bring. Not even the tarot card readers and the mediums, they don't have a clue. <laughs> but they can make some money by lying to you about it. Oh, you're going to have a good year next year. Five dollars, please. <laughs> Or they can spend 20 minutes doing the ooby dooby gobby gobby ooby dooby gobby gobby and then they say, oh, you're going to have a good year next year. Hundred dollars, please. <laughs> and they can do that with tarot cards and tea leaves and bones and knuckles and cutting up chickens and all kinds of stuff. It <laughs> drives the price up. And they don't have a clue about what's going to happen. But they do have a clue about how they can lie to people and get a take some advantage. So the best part then is just be satisfied with right now. Right now is good enough, and next year you'll have another right now, and that'll be good enough too. The best things in life are free, and one of the best things that is free is right now. And you've got it. You've got a right now. And you've got another one right now. It's always right now. People, people have the idea they've got to get up in the morning tomorrow morning. And guess what? Nobody's ever able to get up tomorrow morning. Never happens. They get up today. <laughs> in a way, there is no tomorrow. All we've got is a right now. One right now after another, and things keep changing. But whatever happens, you're okay. Can you remember that? Can yes. you remember that? Oh, there's a bug on the leg, but I'm okay. Oh, the politicians are yelling and fighting, but I'm okay. Oh, the wrong guy won. But I'm okay. <laughs> so I would recommend that you do this probably five or six times a day for about 10 minutes is just to sit down and start looking at the thoughts and say, I'm okay. I don't need that. Whatever I thought about, I don't need it. I'm okay without it. Oh, I want her to love me. I'm okay. I don't need her being loved. Then you think about a fountain pen and you say, oh, I want a fountain pen. I need a fountain pen. Oh, no. You don't have a fountain pen right now and you're okay. So whatever you think of, you can just say, never mind, I'm okay. And pretty soon you begin to feel really okay. You can talk yourself into it. 
as I've said often, people talk themselves into feeling bad for their whole life. Now it's time to start talking to yourself about reality, to start talking to yourself about what really is. And what really is, is you're okay. Oh, what a relief it is. Oh, I'm, you're okay. Can you practice that? Yes. All right. Well, let's finish now and you go practice that. Practice being okay. Practice not needing a thing. Practice is not my body, it's just a body. Not my feelings, just feelings. Not my attitude of being a victim, it's just an attitude. It can be changed. Feelings can be changed. Thoughts could be changed. And when you start looking at the body, breathing, getting to know the body, with the idea of it relaxing, then you can change the body into a state of relaxation. Bodies know how to relax. It's the mind that generally keeps the body up tight because they want things. You just say, oh, what a relief it is. It just relax. Those are the four things. The body, the feelings, your attitude, and the thoughts you have. You can change all four of them. So let's finish off now and we'll talk again. Join the join the groups on Skype. That in fact, we also have groups on the Open Sangha Foundation website. Have you joined the website yet? Oh, no, I haven't. Uh, it's. Um, uh, is it found through? Um, is there a, a link? Uh, yeah, sure. Open Sangha Foundation, if you can spell that dot org. Or you know that we've got a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. OK, on the description, every description has the link to open Sangha Foundation dot org. Mm. So you can click on that link. And go log in when you log in, make sure that you put your name correctly and also put in a photo. Put in a good description. Put in enough data so that people want to get to know you. Make some friends. Join the Sangha group. Post some messages, post some comments. Upload a file, upload a PDF. It's actually a website designed to be very interactive. And the best part of it is the search, because we've got about 7,000, 6,000 at least uh, places. You can search by city and find things and people that are close to you. Oh. You can search for people named John. You can search by zip code, search by country. Search by lineage. So you can find all the Theravada watts in Chicago. And then click. And you get a list. Then you can click on their photo and it'll take you to their description. Where you can make friends, join a group, follow. Basically, it's a uh, a Buddhist website uh, that's there's actually a Facebook or an Instagram for Buddhist.
My friend, the web developer, Mikey, is laughing at me. In fact, we've got a very, um, uh, we're developing a tight connection with our, our Facebook account also, where we have about 1,500 members or friends. I like that community. It's wonderful. It's a community. That's why it's called Sangha. Open Sangha. Where you can find people all over the world. It's up and running. It's under development, but it's up and running. Wow. That's wonderful. All right, well, we'll see you later. Okay, yes, definitely.